Lige Langston grew up on a homestead north of Reno and spent his life buckarooing around the West. With no stores nearby, he learned to fashion his own equipment out of the materials at hand, hide and hair. Eventually, Lige quit riding the range, but until his death, he continued to turn out gear that was sought by cowboys and collectors alike. We were fortunate to chronicle his story in a documentary funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. You think you can use this hide? Well, yeah, it looks like a good enough hide just looking at it. This looks like it might have been off of a heifer or something that probably died of calving or some darn thing. Now, they, they tell me this old Ortega down here, Red Bluff country, gets yearling hides and uh, jerseys if he can get them. He likes them the best. They're thin. You don't have to flesh off, flesh much off of them, I guess, and make real tough strings. Now, there's something about rawhide that he knows that a lot of people don't know, that even fools with rawhide. I've always wanted to meet that guy and visit with him to find out. Now, there's a lot of difference in these hides. You'd be surprised. Well, load this in the pickup again, get her where we can, where I can get it home, put it in the brine barrel or whatever you want to call it. Scrape this off and be done with it in an hour or so. The first things that I started making out of it was ropes, rawhide roll riatas. It was cost more than I could afford to buy, so I thought, well, I'll just learn to make them. So I did. Lots of guys in the country then that could work rawhide, knew what to do with it, how to make things out of it, and it was cheap. They could do that and didn't have to buy it, you see. But now it's a little different. They don't have so many chances to get rawhide like they used to and maybe they don't know how to and they don't know how to handle it after they got it. You should just take an old common old cow hide and cut your strings out of it or calf hide, whatever you want to use. And approximately eight feet I got wrote down there and there's eight strings. Forty nine inches long. That's inches they are though. 392 inches. Divide 12 into that and makes 30, almost 33 feet. The amount of string that it's going to take for this hackmore counts up. I mean, it, it, it'll fool you. It's more than you think. These hackamores, when they're finished, are 12 inches inside here. And this string on this button, on the nose button here, takes about 14 feet of string for that, just this button. This uh, string, you can see, is about so it's wider than I need. And so I'll run that through here between the gauge and the, and the uh, knife to cut it down to the same width. But see that now that? Raw hides are working nice because it's just right, just right. See now. Ah, oh, good. Now we got it. Well, this is going to be a hackamore. So you s stick one end in that vise to hold it s tight and steady and start right in the center, the way I do anyway. So you, all you have to do is make sure that you go under two each time. You, one thing you do with your braid is try to pull each strand so that they all pull about the same and, it's, and they stay straight. But you see, it don't take long to braid one. The fellow probably wouldn't get very rich at it. Who was? He don't seem to mind it either. He just acts like he likes that. I noticed when you pull on him, you know, while you kind of tuck his head just a little too. He kind of acts like he wants to be like a hackamore horse. Heck yeah, he hangs pretty nice. There's two main groups, um, in addition to the ranchers, of course, that have a real history here, and those are the Native Americans, particularly the Paiute, Shoshone, and the Washoe, 
and then the Basque. And all of those groups have centuries old folklore. Uh, they have music, they have foods, and of course they have the basketry and other kinds of collecting of berries and songs, spirituality, you name it. It's all there. We met with master weaver Sue Coleman in her home in Carson City. A member of the Washoe Nation, she is keeping tradition alive through her baskets. She was raised in Dresslerville on the reservation where women in her tribe made baskets for everything from cooking to carrying babies. Although her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother were basket makers, Coleman's interest in this traditional art form did not surface immediately. You know that I started weaving probably in my late 30s, um, after my children were raised and I had more time to do it. So um, basket weaving does consume so much of your, of your time and of your life. So because people are working these days, they don't have time to do it. So when my um, mother would say to me, Oh, this, you know, one of your cousins is making beautiful baskets. You need to, you need to learn to do this. So I did, and I, and I wove baskets for a couple of years, and then I just stopped. And I guess it was because it was hard on my hands, because your hands are constantly in water. And it was hard on the house, because your house is always a mess with willows. So I, um, I quit weaving for several years. And my mother kept saying to me, you need to go back to your basket weaving. You need to start your baskets again. And I, I would just agree with her. And she got, she had a heart attack about three and a half years ago. And she called me one morning and said that um, her heart was racing that night and that she was really scared. So I went to the emergency room and met her there. And they flew her into Reno um, for surgery. And when I got there and when I saw her again, she wasn't able to talk. But um, my daughters and I spent the night with her, and I promised her that I would do this for her, that that I would carry on the baskets for her. So um, it was a promise to my mother, and I honor her in that way because she was such a good spiritual person, and just um, she was a wonderful person, and I wanted to do this for her. And this was a promise to her, and I'm following through with that. And so my children will learn, and, and my grandchildren will learn also. They're, they're difficult to make, but when you finish them, they're such a source of pride. Now a master weaver, Coleman has developed the art to near perfection, capturing dozens of first place honors and best of show awards in competitions throughout the West. Her round gift baskets, cradle boards, burden baskets, winnowing trays and miniatures have been exhibited extensively. Coleman is passing the art on to her own daughter, Cynthia Cannon, and the two were awarded a folk arts apprenticeship in 2001. Coleman has made it her life's passion to keep Washoe weaving alive by sharing her art and knowledge in schools and museums throughout the West. In groups that are here that I love just driving through the valley and, and you see them, and then you go out and collect them and document them, and you get a real depth there to these people. And that's really what I like about Nevada. And besides some of the, the arts in the rural areas, there's a lot of urban folk life and urban traditional art. A lot of groups, Hispanic, Thai, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, many, many groups, ethnic groups in Las Vegas and all the different urban areas have traditional arts as well, and that's, those are just as important. And coming up next, an old world musical tradition that's finding an appreciative new home in Nevada.